Um, so we have two brilliant speakers who are going to be talking to us about carnival conservation. So I will just add them now. Hi, how's it going? So, so I just Hello. wanted to- Hi Ellie, to, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm so excited to chat to you today. It's so great to have you here. Uh, so, so this is Thank Elisa you. Sand Dov oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is Elisa Sandoval Serres and Sicelli Sili Nabolo. Um, and you are both, now correct me if I'm wrong, you are both carnival experts who are associated with Oxford Wild Crew. Is that right? Yeah, so I am a PhD student in Wild Crew in the University of Oxford, and C is working in the painted dog conservation in Zimbabwe. But we both work with African wild dogs. Brilliant! Oh my goodness! So, uh, do you want to to share your screen? I'm I'm so excited to hear to hear what you have to do today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hang on, I will just see when your screen comes up. Yes. Let me just check. Oh, can you see it? Uh, yes, it has just come up now. I'm just adding it to the, the screen. Brilliant. Cool. Alrighty, well, you, you guys take it away. And again, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. I'm so excited to hear, hear your story. Great, yeah. thank you. So I am Elisa Sandoval Ceres, and, um, and she is my colleague, C. And we are going to talk about how African wild dogs cope with lions and spotted hyenas. So we both are conservationists. I have a degree in biology from the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. And now I am a PhD student in the University of Oxford with Wild Crew. And she is, has a bachelor in the GIS and Earth Observation from the University of Zimbabwe. And now she is the GIS specialist, GIS specialist from painted dog conservation uh, from Zimbabwe. So I want to talk first about how I started my career. I always liked animals and I was very worried about their conservation. So I, uh, for my professional practices, I went to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico to study tapirs. You can see here a picture of a tapir with the baby from uh, Ecosur uh, Research and also jaguars. And we also do conservation courses um, through an NGO called Biomass, which are conservation courses in the Mayan rainforest. And we uh, teach people how to study mammals in the Mexican rainforest. And then I was very interested in social carnivores. And that's when I joined the Kalahari Mirkat project in South Africa. And we actually published a children's book, which says that uh, meerkats are are better in the wild and it's not good for them to be a pet. And I also collaborated, well, I was a volunteer for one month in the Yellowstone Wolf Project in the USA. And these uh, two carnivore species uh, got my interest in cooperative breeding uh, behavior species, which I will talk about now. And one cooperative breeder carnivore is the African wild dog, which is, um, uh, or also named painted dog, which is a carnivore. It's a canide, but it's not a dog. It's a completely unique species. And well, they weigh around 22 kilos. They live in packs in family groups of around five to 30 individuals. And they are characterized because they are excellent hunters. And well, their home ranges are quite big, as you can see, and they are cooperative breeders. And what is a species that is a cooperative breeder? So uh, cooperative breeders are species that live in family groups where normally only the dominant uh, pair, so the dominant female and the dominant male are the ones that breed. And that all the other, um, uh, the, all the other members of the groups help to raise the pups, uh, either by babysitting at the dance or uh, providing food to them, so regurgitating or vomiting in this case, uh, the food to the pups. And uh, they can, uh, well, uh, the liters can be of one or 15 pups. And for, um, for, for a family group that uh, needs to survive, they need to be at least five wild dogs so that they can raise the pups successfully. 
This is a very endangered species uh, where uh, the population worldwide or in Africa, in Africa uh, is decreasing. And there are different human threats, but the, pre the main threat, uh, the main biological threat is the competition with larger carnivores. And well, in the world, there are less than 7,000 adults. Your turn. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Estrela Sele. Uh, I'm a GI specialist at Painted Dog Conservation. I joined uh, the conservation project in 2017 as an intern and I've been going in the field, tracking and monitoring painted dogs in the wild. I also collect uh, the data and then I capture it and then process it into maps. So I'm briefly going to talk about painted dog conservation where Elisa is conducting uh, her research. Uh, so painted dog conservation is a private voluntary organization which was established uh, in mid 90s through scientific research in Wange National Park. And uh, the research has now uh, expanded all the way to Manapools and uh, Lower Zambezi area. Uh, painted Dogs' mission is to create an environment where painted dogs uh, can thrive. Uh, as you can see from this image here, uh, painted dogs once occupied about 39 uh, range states uh, in Africa, but uh, today they are only found in about 14 range states. And in Zimbabwe, the population is estimated at about 700 only. Uh, there are actually a number of factors that have been identified to, affect, to be affecting uh, the population of painted dogs. And as Elisa already mentioned, um, one of them being the large uh, carnivores, uh, we also have diseases uh, as another threat. And then we also have um, anthropogenic factors, uh, also a major uh, threat to painted dogs alive. Uh, and our research over the past years have managed to identify some factors uh, that uh, some actually some threats that are affecting uh, the population of painted dogs, not only the population but of the painted dogs, but um, it affect, it's affecting the biodiversity at large in Wange National Park. Okay, so uh, these are some of the threats that painted dogs has uh, managed to identify and certain actions have been taken to combat uh, these uh, threats. So we have poaching, which is uh, mostly in the form of snaring. Uh, these snares are put up by the local poachers and uh, they do not discriminate uh, the snares, they just can kill any um, animal, you know. So um, we have the anti-poaching unity. Uh, these are rangers who like go out each and every day patrolling, uh, searching and removing uh, these wire snares, which are a huge threat uh, to our animals. And then uh, when they remove the snares, uh, we don't just pile them up. We reuse the snares. We have uh, Ikanyana Art Center, where we have local artisans, again, who are trained to create crafts that are made from these snares. Um, then we also carry out some educational programs uh, where we target mostly the young generation, we target um, schools from the surrounding area. Uh, those that are surrounding like Wanga National Park, we educate them about importance. Our children are the future generation. Therefore, we believe if we catch them, while they are young, they are gonna grow up with the conservation mentality. Then we also carry out some outreach uh, programs, educating people um, the importance of uh, conserving our wildlife because um, those local people are the ones who are mostly affected by these animals. And then we also have road kills as another threat. So we have um, erected some road signs uh, along the areas close to the park. Uh, we are trying to create an awareness to the motorists so that they drive safely, uh, remembering that they are wild animals uh, crossing around this area. And um, I'm sure the previous speaker mentioned how these roads uh, affect um, the paint, the, the, uh, affects the animals, uh, how they die each and every year. So as painted dog conservation, we have also identified that one. Then we have um, diseases such as rabies and distemper. So we have uh, a rehabilitation facility 
uh, which is not a breeding facility. It's just a hospital for the sick and injured uh, painted dogs. So we bring in uh, dogs and then we treat them. And then once they recover, we release them back into the world. And then we also carry out some vaccination programs where we vaccinate domesticated dogs from the areas buffering Wanga National Park. Uh, that's where we are trying to prevent the spread of rabies uh, between domesticated uh, animals and our wild animals. Okay, then uh, land use again, uh, the loss of, uh, happy, the loss of um, habitat is also uh, another threat with uh, increasing human uh, settlements. Um, we have seen how um, many species have lost uh, their quality habitat and they have to move uh, to those protected areas where they have to um, sort of compete with uh, the larger carnivores, like for instance, painted dogs. Uh, they usually try to move maybe from the protected areas to these community areas. Uh, but if there are more human settlements, then they have to move back into the protected areas and they have to face uh, their arrivals, the lions and uh, the hyenas. And then uh, therefore, as painted dog conservation, we do carry out some community outreach programs where we try to teach the people uh, to live in harmony with nature, to try and uh, save these beautiful animals before they like become extinct. Um, then another threat which has been uh, identified is the predation from large uh, carnivores. Um, our research team, uh, they've identified that one, and we are very glad to have Elisa, uh, who, who's going to be conducting a research uh, to find out how the painted dogs are coping with uh, the competition uh, from lions and hyenas. And then I'll leave this time for Alyssa. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Okay. So thank you, C, for uh, introducing what Painted Dog Conservation does. So I am collaborating with Painted Dog Conservation. And uh, so I will talk about uh, how African wild dogs cope with lions and hyenas. Well, African wild dogs are a small carnivore, uh, um, a medium carnivore, but they are smaller uh, than lions and hyenas. So this makes them subordinate carnivores compared to the larger competing dominant carnivores such as lions and hyenas. And this means that African wild dogs need to have a balance between finding water and prey and trying to avoid larger carnivores um, like lions and hyenas. And how do lions and hyenas affect African wild dogs? Well, before saying that, it's important to mention that in semi-arid ecosystems, water is extremely important. And also, like uh, that's where uh, because prey is um, prey gather around um, waterholes, and in consequence, carnivores also gather around waterholes. And lions and hyenas uh, affect wild dogs through different things, but the main um, thing is the direct mortality, especially to African wild dog pups. So lions can kill around twelve percent of wild dog adults and. 31% of wild dog pups. Spotted hyenas do not kill that many uh, wild dogs, uh, but they still do um, in sometimes. Africa, actually, spotted hyenas mainly affect wild dogs through kleptoparasitism. And what is kleptoparasitism? This is basically hyenas stealing wild dog kills. And uh, it's been studied that between 6 to 85% of the wild dog kills are, st are uh, stole, uh, stolen by hyenas, which can be uh, very bad for wild dogs' um, food intake. Another consequence of uh, another impact that these large carnivores have on wild dogs is uh, competition for prey and exclusion from prey rich areas. This means that wild dogs uh, need to be in areas that have less prey as, where the, as the areas with more prey is where lions and hyenas are, which is normally around water holes. Another impact is den selection. So normally wild dogs den around uh, rock terrain and uh, high vegetation cover areas to avoid um, uh, lions and hyenas, and uh, they also then uh, to uh, far away from waterholes to hide their pups from lions and hyenas. 
And this means that wild dogs need to travel long distances to get their food and then go back to the den uh, to give food to the pups, um, which is, uh, and because of these long distances, that is how um, dominant carnivores are affecting wild dogs on their reproduction. And another thing is that normally, um, well, if, for example, this is Wanga National Park, so hyenas and lions density is higher within the natural area, which makes that wild dogs need to uh, sometimes prefer to go out from the protected areas to avoid larger carnivores. And when they go out from the protected area, that is when wild dogs get exposed to human threats, such as snares and road kills. This is why my objective is to determine how wild dogs cope with lions and hyenas in an ecosystem with artificial water provision. The study area is Wange National Park, which is an unfenced protected area in Zimbabwe. It's semi-arid and there are only water available for wildlife during the dry season is artificially pumped water holes by the government of Zimbabwe. These are some of the water holes in the, in the national park. So first I want to look at how, uh, what is the diet overlap of these three carnivores. And in order to do that, scat samples of the three carnivores were collected in different years. And then the hair found on the scats of these carnivores uh, was uh, put on like a microscope and then pictures of the hairs were taken. And as you can see, each hair of each prey is different, like the scale patterns are different. So for example, the first two images correspond to an impala, and the second two images, those scales correspond to, war, uh, to warthogs. And that is how we can identify how uh, which prey is eaten by uh, each carnivore. So some preliminary results, the wild dogs prey around 20 species in Wange, and the main species uh, or the preferred one were uh, impala, kudu, bushbook, and common ricker. And the preferred species for lions and hyenas was also impala and kudu, so that's the main competition, but also buffalo and sable antelope. Also, as you can see in this graph, so this is uh, how uh, the prey of um, the carnivores, like how, what's the water dependency of the prey. And as you can see in these graphs, this is African wild dogs prey, spotted hyenas a diet and lions diet. And in the African wild dogs, they uh, prey upon um, uh, low water dependent species. They prey, they, they have a higher percentage of low water dependent species compared to the prey eaten by lions and hyenas. And another result is that um, the less water hole density there is, the more diet overlap. So the more competition for resources is between wild dogs and lions and wild dogs and hyenas. And also when there is more uh, large um, predators uh, density, then the diet overlap between wild dogs and high, uh, between wild dogs and these two predators also increases, except in areas where there is a high water hole density, yeah, the lion density uh, is not, uh, there is, so when there is more water hole density, uh, there is um, more, there is less diet overlap of wild dogs with um, lions. So also wild dogs reproduction. So as I said before, uh, when they are denning, they need to travel long distances to get to gather food, and they also need to avoid uh, hyenas and lions. So I want to look at uh, how. Long, how, what is the distance that the wild dogs need to travel to gather food and then go back to the dens, and also how they can avoid uh, the, uh, the dominant predators. So they, I want to see which is the strategy that wild dogs are using. So there are two main strategies. One is proactive and the other one is reactive. So proactive basically means uh, that they have a previous knowledge of where lions and hyenas are. So they are in, uh, they, wild dogs are found in areas where there are very few, that where, there, where lions and hyenas are not uh, roaming there. And the reactive strategy is that wild dogs, hyenas and lions are basically in the same area, but wild dogs are avoiding them through an immediate threat. 
And my hypothesis are that wild dogs are going to use the proactive strategy when there is uh, when it is the dry season, so when there is less vegetation cover, and that they will use a reactive strategy when there is the when it is the wet season and uh, when there is more vegetation cover and also when wild dogs are around water holes. In other studies, it's been found that wild dogs mainly use proactive strategy, but let's see what they do in Wangen National Park. So the uh, ultimate goals is to assess the role of water uh, in the competition of wild dogs with larger carnivores, to ultimately propose water management solutions to reduce wild dogs competition and mortality, and give insight into these endangered uh, give in, they give conservation insight into their um, into these endangered species. So the way we study wild dogs is we put uh, collars on uh, on different individuals, and then with an antenna we track uh, we try to find where they are. So whenever we hear a beep, that is where we need to go. That's the direction we need to go. So at the moment, uh, all some wild dogs have VHF collars that they send signals to the antenna. But we want to set GPS collars so that we can know exactly in which um, coordinate or in which location wild dogs are found and um, in different and exactly in which time. So for that, uh, we would uh, appreciate if you could uh, support the project and donate for GPS collars for wild dogs through these links. And well, finally, we believe that through um, through collaboration, we can actually help wildlife conservation, combining research and conservation actions. So thanks a lot for first to the government of Zimbabwe and also the University of Oxford, Painted Dog Conservation, Ruford, and also to Global Biodiversity Festival for inviting us to present. And I don't know if you have any particular questions. Oh my goodness, what an amazing talk. Um, I'll just... There you go. No, that was fascinating. That was fascinating. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us to that today. And if anybody has a question, then do stick it in the chat and I, I will read it out. Um, but man, I've got so many questions about this. So, so first of all, kind of, you know, you, you've laid out some really amazing research that's kind of going on. What's what's the kind of next steps? What's your next research plans? Um, so at the moment, I am in Zimbabwe, as you can see, with um, in painted dog conservation. So we are uh, next week. We are going to try to uh, put one GPS collar on a wild dog, but we need to put uh, more. And uh, so my so my next research plan is actually uh, to gather behavioral data of wild dogs to see how they react uh, uh, depending on the area that they are in. So if they are at uh, areas where there's high density of lions and hyenas, if their behavior changes depending on which area they are. And, and yeah. Sorry, I don't know why there's feedback. Um, uh, what, what's kind of some of the, the big challenges that you've had? Have you faced any, what kind of challenges are, have you found to this type of work? Well, all, all sorts of challenges. Uh, I think wild dogs is one of the hardest species to study because there are not that many, so they are in low densities. You don't see them very often, so you can spend three days without seeing them uh, or more. And especially if you want to find a pack that is not colored, um, you just need to go and track for footprints uh, or feces. And even when wild dogs are colored, sometimes they are in very um, dense habitat so that the car cannot pass. So you don't see them, so you cannot gather behavioral data. Um, so yeah, there are so, a lot of uh, challenges. Also, another challenge is um, like because the terrain uh, has it's not like um, it's not pavimented. Like there's so you get like um, flat tires all the time. You have to drive for long distances. Sometimes you don't even find them. Sometimes you find them, but they run away. They can like just travel like 10 kilometers per day or more, but yeah. at least 10 kilometers. Yeah, so it is very challenging, everything. And then camping with lions and elephants, that's <laughs> that's also scary with poisonous snakes. 
<laughs> Every time you have a flat tire, you need to watch for lions so that they are not around so that you can go out of the car. So yeah, it is challenging, but it is very exciting. And once you see the wild dogs, it is very, very nice. Um, I think there's a, it's an amazing species to study. And it is very sad that they're highly endangered. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So that you showed of the declines, it's just crazy. And yeah. I, I, can, I can imagine that there's a lot of people watching this who want to be doing what you want to, you know, kind of young conservationists. What advice would you give to anyone who wants to kind of go into your fields? So do you want to do uh, an advice first? Okay, um, I think first of all, to be in this kind of field, you really have to have passion for wild animals. Uh, you really have to have passion for being in the bush because um, it's not an office job. You have to be out in the field uh, monitoring these painted dogs. Um, and then uh, you have to enroll probably in a course that will lead you into conservation. Um, but not only are we targeting like the animals, we have like uh, humans as well. Like uh, I mentioned that we do work with the community uh, that is surrounding uh, this area. Um, the community is living in areas surrounding the national park. Therefore you have to know uh, how to like uh, interact with uh, people and um, educate them because uh, some people like uh, they, they are not aware or on the importance of uh, wild animals. So for someone who wants to venture into, into this um, field, you really have to have passion for it. I think that's um, one thing I can say. Then uh, definitely enroll at the right institution, take voluntary um, work. You can do voluntary work as well. It can also help you in that. Yes, yeah. I agree. I agree with C. And also I would say that perseverance is a lot. Um, because uh, perseverance and also um, like this spirit of adventure, because it is not easy to be in the wild camping for several days and also perseverance to, do not, to, to, to keep positive besides being for a whole week without, uh, without seeing wild dogs. So trying to, trying to stay positive besides all the challenges that you face during the field. <laughs> you, you guys are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Yes, every, everyone in conservation. Uh, yeah, and I would definitely enhance people who have this passion for conservation to stick to it because we need conservationists nowadays, like biodiversity, the whole world needs conservationists. So please stick into this field and try to do what your passion tells you to do yeah that's that's such a great such a great <laughs> note to end on thank you so much thank you so much for coming and talking to us and keep doing what you're doing you you guys are amazing inspirational intrepid women you know you're just so impressive thank you so much for coming and talking to us today and thank you for a brilliant talk and and also sharing your your insights about the field thank you so much um, you're welcome thank you very much Bye. Bye.